right, everybody, we're going to talk here about some disorders of the parathyroids, but uh, this is primarily a surgical topic. So um, I'm going to primarily be focusing on how to distinguish uh, primary and secondary hypoparathyroidism and primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism, rather than go into too much detail on the causes, um, especially when we talk about parathyroid adenoma, because that is a surgical problem. So we'll talk about these different disorders, um, but we're not going to talk so much about the treatment of these individual disorders. What we will talk about, however, is the treatment of hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. Now, I've already did a video on uh, the dis disorders of calcium disturbances. Uh, I would suggest going back and watching that. I give a little bit more airtime to what PTH is and what it does. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so just an overview of the parathyroids. They are the regulator of calcium levels. The big one, the big hormone that it secretes is PTH. Remember that calcitonin, it opposes the activity of PTH. However, that comes from the thyroid, the C cells of the thyroid. Primary hyperparathyroidism is high calcium from an overactive parathyroid gland, and usually that's due to an adenoma. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is an increased parathyroid activity as a response to low calcium. So the calcium, for whatever reason, is low. It releases negative feedback on the parathyroids, and so the parathyroids are working overtime, but not autonomously. They're doing it because you have a low calcium level. So they're working the way that they're supposed to. Then tertiary hyperparathyroidism is not commonly tested. It's an increased parathyroid activity after a long period of hi uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism that's been corrected. This is what you're going to see lab-wise. So if you know your physiology, all of this should make sense. If you don't, go back and watch my uh, previous video. Now this is commonly, uh, this kind of graph is commonly thrown around on step one. So I would suggest knowing this graph because step one loves to give graphs. Um, so know you have calcium here on the x-axis, PTH here on the y-axis. You should know, okay, in this area, we've got low calcium, but low PTH. What does that say? Parathyroid glands not working, not making PTH. Therefore, you're gonna have low calcium. Well, over here, you have high calcium, but low PTH. What that's telling you is you're getting high calcium, but it is not due to the PTH. And so something is happening, maybe mimicking PTH. The big one we think of is PTHRP. This should be considered a malignancy until proven otherwise. Well, here we have hyperparathyroidism and a high calcium. Um, so you have high PTH, high calcium. Well, here, the PTH is doing exactly what we expect it to do. We just have too much. And so that's hyperparathyroidism. That's usually an adenoma. And then secondary hyperparathyroidism is here. Well, what do we have here? We have a low calcium, but a high PTH. And we expect that. We expect a high PTH with low calcium. So this is secondary hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid glands are working overtime, but appropriately because we have a low calcium. Uh, and this can be due to a number of causes, but usually it's due to insufficiency of either uh, calcium or vitamin D. So we already talked about this. This here can be useful for you. So this is the corrected calcium. If you have a patient with hypoalbuminemia, low albumin, so which you could see in patients with nephrotic syndrome or liver failure, um, their serum calcium may not be exactly uh, representative of their overall calcium level. And that's because calcium and albumin bind together. So there are two ways around this. You can use this formula, or you can just go ahead and get an ionized calcium, which will measure the free calcium in the serum. Now, remember that calcium stabilizes neuronal membranes, and that's going to play a big role in some of the neurologic symptoms that can develop. And remember that most mild disturbances of calcium are indeed asymptomatic. These are the labs you should get when calcium is disturbed. So if you have a patient with an abnormal serum calcium, 
Um, what you should do, the first, the, the two very first things that you should do is get a PTH level and ionized calcium. The PTH level is the most important next step, um, but like anything in medicine, you're not going to be ordering one test at a time. So what you want to be doing, anytime one electrolyte is off, sodium, potassium, bicarb, calcium, magnesium, you want to order all of your electrolytes. So we're going to get a magnesium, we're going to get a phosphate, we're going to get a BMP, remember that's sodium, potassium bicarb, chloride, glucose, lots of things. It also has your renal function tests. Chest x-ray may be useful, uh, and then an EKG may be useful as well. So hypercalcemia is a calcium level usually more than 10.5. So this can be due to two big things. Primary hyperparathyroidism. Remember, not a diagnosis, but it's uh, it gives you a hint. Um, so this would be a high PTH, which results in high calcium for the reasons that I gave when I talked about uh, the overview of calcium disturbances. Um, so this is purely due to a high PTH, and this is usually due to an adenoma or hyperplasia of the parathyroid glands. Remember, primary, it's due to the gland itself. It can also be associated with a secondary hypoparathyroidism. In this case, you have a high calcium for some other reason, and therefore it suppresses the parathyroid gland. So in this case, you would have a high calcium, but a low PTH. Um, so remember the symptoms, stones, bones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. I go over this in the previous talk. Uh, the major things that you need to consider here are drugs, primary hyperparathyroidism, which is the number one cause. When you hear that, just think, think adenoma, okay? Um, carcinoma is possible, hyperplasia is possible, but 85% of causes are due to adenoma. In malignancies and other conditions, and here we're not talking about parathyroid cancer, we're talking here about other malignancies, uh, the PTH will be low. Why? Because things like squamous cell lung cancer or breast cancer can secrete PTHRP, which acts just like PTH, but when you go to measure the PTH, it will be low because it's not PTH, it just resembles PTH. Um, so that's another thing that you want to consider when you've got a patient with hypercalcemia. Look on a test question for a smoker, a woman who hasn't gotten her mammograms in 10 years, uh, and so forth. Provided that the patient is stable, the best first step in a patient who's hypercalcemic is PTH. Patients with a high PTH level are likely to have, have an adenoma. However, it may be useful to get a 24-hour urine calcium. That will help you distinguish it from something called familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which has a fairly complex pathophysiology that I'm not going to go into. But just remember that FHH is the big uh, differential when you have a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism. And the mechanism by which it works, again, very, very, very complex. Patients with a low PTH level, we're thinking hypercalcemia malignancy. So your next step then is going to be a chest x-ray, mammogram if they haven't had one, CT, um, you're looking for cancer here. This is a um, algorithm that I made for you for hypercalcemia. So note that our first step is to get the calcium, the ionized calcium, that'll confirm it. Your next step is to get a PTH, and that will tell you if what you're dealing with is a primary hyperparathyroidism or that this is a secondary, uh, there's a, a secondary cause. Um, so do note the urine calcium can be useful for you, especially if you're dealing with a younger patient. Um, if they do have a low PTH, what you're dealing with then is a secondary hypoparathyroidism. You're getting calcium from somewhere else. Um, so it could be vitamin D intoxication. It could be sarcoidosis. Remember, that increases your vitamin D all by itself. Other granulomatous diseases can do that. Lymphoma can do it. If you have a high PTHRP, that is a malignancy, usually lung cancer. All right, so this... I kind of already went over. Um, remember that parathyroid neoplasia is associated with men type 1 and 2A. Usually this is a solitary adenoma, but it can be a uh, all four uh, glands are hyperplastic. The treatment for hypercalcemia. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is give fluids. So most patients with significant, uh, with significant hypercalcemia uh, they're going to be dehydrated. Why? As I mentioned in a previous video, calcium antagonizes ADH, so you're going to have a diabetes insipidus-like picture. Uh, 
Um, another reason is that calcium just acts as an osmotic diuretic. So the problem here then is that when you are dehydrated, your, your plasma volume goes down, and so your calcium concentration goes up, and it just creates this vicious cycle. So the first thing that you do is fluids. And what you want to do then is you want to monitor their urine output. If their urine output normalizes um, then and their calcium level normalizes, uh, then what you have then is a treated patient. Okay, so some, most of the time you only have to do fluids. Uh, of course, you will want to follow their calcium level. So if that does not help, then your next step is to give loop diuretics. So furosemide. And then if that doesn't help, then and only then will you go for things that will directly lower the calcium. So bisphosphonates can be used. Uh, IV calcitonin can be used. But remember that the long-term strategy is to address the underlying cause. Other causes, um, so primary hyperparathyroidism, if you do have an adenoma or hyperplasia, which should be the, the number one on your differential, um, then we need to give these patients a parathyroidectomy. And so your next step when you are considering the patient for surgery is to get nuclear imaging or sestamibi imaging. Why do we do that? It doesn't, it's not part of the treatment, okay? What it is, is it's a test that will tell the surgeon where the adenoma is so that they're going in um, with a clear head where to look. You know, we don't want surgeons going in blind. Remember that there are complications of operating in the neck. Very bloody, very dangerous area. Uh, FHH, we already talked about, does not typically require treatment. And uh, with malignancy, we already mentioned, um, there are further laboratory workups that you can do. Hypocalcemia is a low serum calcium, so this can be due to a variety of causes. It can be due to primary hypoparathyroidism. Here, we're primarily thinking removal of the parathyroid glands, iatrogenic. This patient has a history of Graves' disease. They were on, you know, medications for that. It didn't work. They had to go in and get a total thyroidectomy, um, and now they're sitting here with a low calcium level. What happened? The parathyroid glands were removed. It can also be associated with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So in this case, you have a low calcium level. The parathyroid glands um, functionally, they properly uh, detect the low calcium levels, so they secrete PTH. Or it can be due to hyperphosphatemia. Okay, what's going on here? So usually what will happen with hyperphosphatemia is you have tumor lysis syndrome or chronic kidney disease. Both of those will cause increased phosphate. So you have increased phosphate. Well, what happens? This will bind calcium. Okay, so I'm not going to write the whole chemical formula here, but it'll bind calcium, resulting in a lower calcium level. Um, so think of a patient with long-standing kidney disease or perhaps a patient who's on chemotherapy. Either way, that's going to be really obvious in the history. You don't have long-standing end-stage renal disease and you don't know it. You don't have cancer and be on chemotherapy and you don't know it, right? So this will come up in your, in your history. So you won't need to detect this on your own. Just know that it happens. Uh, so here we're looking at neuronal hyperactivity. Remember that calcium stabilizes the membranes. Uh, but uh, another thing that you can see here is a prolonged QT. Chvostex and Trousseau sign, I've never seen it in my life. I have been working in medicine for going on 12 years now, never seen it. I've dealt with plenty of patients with calcium disturbances, but I've never seen those. Can come up on your exam though. Seizures is another good one. So if you've got a patient with an unexplained seizure, get a calcium level. Uh, some causes that must be immediately considered are, as mentioned, a past thyroidectomy, vitamin D deficiency. So, you know, most people get good amounts of vitamin D, but think of people with malabsorption, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, and stuff like that. And then renal failure. Provide the patient a stable. Again, if you've got calcium disturbances, stabilize them, then get a serum PTH level. A low PTH level means that the parathyroid gland is not working properly. Either it's not working properly or it's absent, so past thyroidectomy, or hypomagnesemia. Remember that magnesium is responsible for helping the parathyroid gland release PTH. So your parathyroid gland could be working properly. There's nothing structurally wrong with it. But if you don't have enough magnesium, then you're going to have problems with secreting PTH. 
a high PTH is consistent with renal failure or vitamin D deficiency. So here with renal failure, you're losing calcium through your kidneys. And um, as a consequence, you're going to up your PTH to try to correct the hypocalcemia. With vitamin D deficiency, because vitamin D is responsible for a lot of calcium absorption, you're going to get a hypocalcemia and then you're gonna get a, uh, a, an increase in your PTH. Now remember that that PTH takes 25 hydroxy vitamin D and converts it to 125 hydroxy vitamin D. PTH helps that process. It, it, it helps the enzyme, that one alpha hydroxylase. However, if you're vitamin D deficient, then you can have all the PTH in the world. You can have all the functional one alpha hydroxylase in the world. It's not gonna help. So you're just gonna keep making PTH because you've lost the negative feedback. So again, low calcium, low PTH, think primary hypoparathyroidism with a history of uh, thyroidectomy. Low calcium plus high PTH, think vitamin D or calcium deficiency, uh, usually secondary to malabsorption. This is uh, another uh, way that you can go about this. Um, so another thing that's really useful to you if you have hypocalcemia, remember to get the ionized calcium, get the phosphate level, get the PTH level. Those are all good. Um, but looking at your creatinine can be helpful too because what that'll tell you is, is this a problem in the kidneys? If you've got a patient with a high phosphate level and a high creatinine level, uh, you really need to think of this as a, a, a problem going on in the kidneys. Not always, but in many cases. And here I have phosphate poisoning. I'm going to put in here uh, tumor lysis syndrome because that's basically phosphate poisoning. The treatment of hypocalcemia is very straightforward. It's calcium gluconate. Now, some people say calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is very irritating, so we give calcium gluconate. Long term, it's going to be calcium supplementation and vitamin D. Remember, if they have renal failure, the problem is making calcitriol, the final product. Um, so you will need to give them calcitriol. Um, if it's liver failure or just regular old uh, uh, vitamin D deprivation, maybe due to malnutrition, you can just give them regular vitamin D. If you've got a patient with severe malabsorption like Crohn's disease, you may need to give parenteral vitamin D because they're going to have a hard, hard time absorbing oral vitamin D. These are some of the other causes. So we talked about a past thyroidectomy. We talked about a magnesium deficiency. That's why we're checking magnesium. We talked about renal failure. These patients will need to be supplemented with calcitriol. Vitamin D deficiency, if it's just dietary, you can just give vitamin D2 or something like that. Hyperphosphatemia, fluids and dialysis if necessary. This is often, but not always, due to a renal cause. Could also be tumor lysis syndrome. And then malabsorption, which we already talked about. So to recap, in calcium disturbances, the most important labs are ionized calcium, BMP, serum magnesium, and PTH levels. You should always get those labs when you've got a patient with a disturbed calcium level. Hypercalcemia is abnormally high calcium in the blood. Uh, symptoms are neuronal hypoactivity along with the stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones can ultimately result in coma. Best initial test is PTH. Most common cause is an adenoma. The treatment is fluid replacement. If that's not enough, Ferrosamide, if that's not enough, bisphosphonate, bisphosphonates and uh, calcitonin are options. Hypocalcemia is abnormally low calcium. Symptoms here are neuronal hyperactivity, paresthesias, tetany, seizure. Best initial test here, again, PTH. Most common cause of hypocalcemia is um, not counting uh, hypoalbuminemia. It's going to be uh, thyroidectomy if you have a low PTH, if you have a high PTH, it's renal failure and tumor lysis syndrome. And the treatment here is calcium gluconate.